Uh, we're really pleased to welcome our speakers for today's webinar, talking about the basics of electric vehicles for municipality is Rob, municipalities is Rob Graff from DVRPC. We also have uh, Andrea Friedman from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection here to tell us about permitting and incentives for EV charging. And Kathleen Lewis, uh, the e-mobility programs manager from BPU to talk about utility incentives and electric vehicle incentives that are coming in the near future. So that's great. And we'd like to uh, thank our sponsors and program underwriters for making this programming possible. Thank you for spending your time with us today. Um, also, we wanna let you know that there are more summit events remaining throughout the week, including a number of events focused on electric vehicles and uh, green business speed networking. You have an opportunity to hear from vendors in specific areas of sustainability. And here's the link to get to the list of events and registration. Thank you for joining us today. And now we're gonna turn over to Rob Graff, who's going to tell us about electric vehicle uh, basics. And I'm good gonna morning. stop sharing so we can go to his slides. Great, uh, good morning. I'm going to <clears throat> share my screen here in a moment if I can uh, make that happen. Just give me a moment. You should be seeing a, a single slide, is that correct? Yep. Okay, great. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rob Graff. I manage the Office of Energy and Climate Change Initiatives at the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, which uh, services greater Philadelphia, including uh, four counties of South Jersey uh, or central New Jersey. I'm going to give you a general overview of uh, two tools we've uh, developed to help with cost effective and practical development of electric vehicles in our region, which will include a little bit of a uh, EV 101 to kick us off before we get into the details of some of the legislation and funding. Uh, uh, I can skip that slide that shows who we are. Uh, we've, been, we've been working with electric vehicles for quite some time, uh, seeing electrification as one of the major solutions for decarbonizing the transportation sector. We developed uh, several EV readiness plans for the region and serve on several electric vehicle advisory committees and task forces, including one that's going to be established soon by Sustainable Jersey. Uh, and we're generally recognized as a sort of one of the go-to uh, resources in the region for electric vehicles. But I would like to note that while uh, our office has been involved with electric vehicle planning due to their lower carbon footprint, we recognize electric vehicles are still passenger, single occupancy passenger vehicles often, and come with the same problems as all passenger vehicles. They cause congestion, require parking, <clears throat> can cause crashes with pedestrians, cyclists, and other vehicles. And they also uh, currently do not pay uh, the state and federal uh, gas taxes that help pay for roads. So they're not a magic bullet, but they're very good in many ways. Um, the two major resources uh, are here. You can find them at, the, that, at that website there, dvrpcenergy.climate. Uh, the first one is um, what we're calling the Electric Vehicle Resource Kit for Municipalities, also valuable to any fleet intended to answer questions about general questions for municipalities on how to, uh, how to what, what do they need to know about electric vehicles. Um, focused for the greater Philadelphia region in, and for municipal managers in, uh, in Pennsylvania, New Jersey with resources in, in both of those areas, but it should be generally useful in its information to any fleet owner uh, or even potential individuals who are or EV owners has some good information. Um, it has these uh, six sections or eight sections rather, and I'm going to focus on a, uh, a couple of them because uh, uh, my colleagues will be focusing on some of the others. I'm going to focus on, on these three, uh, sort of an EV introduction to electric vehicles uh, and uh, then talking a little bit about incorporating them into a municipal fleet, including what vehicle to choose for your first electric vehicle. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not sure how familiar all of you are with electric vehicles and there's a lot of, um, so before we get started, I'm, I'm going to take a minute to make sure we're using the same EV vocabulary. Uh, you'll find some uh, overlapping and some confusion in the terms. Uh, these are still sort of settling down as this is a new technology, but in general, we use the term 
PEV to mean a plug-in electric vehicle, and an umbrella term for a vehicle that plugs into an external source to charge an onboard battery that provides electricity for an electric motor that uh, helps drive the car. Uh, a BEV, a battery electric vehicle, also known as an all-electric vehicle, is a plug-in electric vehicle that has only a battery and electric vehicle or sorry, an electric motor to power the vehicle. These include your uh, your Teslas, the Nissan Leaf, the Chevy Bolt with a B. Uh, and then there's also other vehicles that plug in are the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, which uses both an internal combustion engine and an electric motor with a battery that recharges from plugging into an external source. The battery can either assist the internal combustion engine or fully power the vehicle until it runs out. Uh, and at which point the internal combustion engine takes over. This include the Chevy Volt with a V and the Prius Prime uh, and a lot of other vehicles. These can often meet your needs uh, running all electric for your typical 30, 40 mile daily usage. And then if you're taking a longer trip, turn to um, uh, the internal combustion engine. Hybrid electric vehicles doesn't come into play for this discussion. That's sort of the vehicles that like a Prius typically the main and lots of others that have a, a large battery on board that's charged by the vehicle's braking and that assists the internal combustion engine in moving the car. It significantly improves, improves gas mileage, but it does not plug in. Then you may also hear about fuel cell electric vehicles, which basically run a, rather than having a battery on it, they have a fuel cell, which produces electricity directly from uh, gaseous hydrogen uh, emitting uh, water vapor uh, only. Um, and uh, we're, there's no, uh, we, we just looked at all the vehicles registered in the state of New Jersey, and there was exactly one fuel cell vehicle uh, registered in New Jersey. So those are still a futures technology. You also may hear the term ZEV or Z zero emission vehicle. Uh, that uh, basically incorporates um, in, in various ways uh, the PEVs and the fuel cell electric vehicles. The terms I'm going to be using today are really we're talking mostly about we're talking about pretty much either all electric all only about plug-in electric vehicles. Um, there's three charging technologies out there uh, called very intelligently level one, level two, and then uh, there's a, a higher power DC fast charging. I'll go over these very briefly. Level one charging is basically your 120 volt outlet up to about 1400 watts. It uses about what a powerful hairdryer uses as far as uh, electricity. It has about two to five miles of range in an hour. So say four hours, if you park overnight for eight hours that uh, at home, that gives you 32 miles, which for many people will more than uh, handle their daily driving, particularly if they're using a vehicle simply for commuting locally. Level two charging <coughs> is a 240 volt, like an electric stove with all the burners and ovens on, uh, it's about 7,700 watts. This can uh, add, add a lot more, 10 to 20 miles of range in an hour. It takes a lot of electricity. So in some cases for homes, you, you may need to upgrade your electrical um, supply line from, you know, if you, if you have a 100 amp system, you may need a 200 amp system to accommodate this. Uh, this is typically used, a lot of people use this at home because you can, you know, get a lot of charge on your battery overnight. You're going to leave with a full battery every morning. Uh, these are often ones that are used at workplaces uh, and occasionally in uh, sort of public usage, like the ones you might see at a, uh, a Whole Foods or, or something like that. Um, they don't really add enough mileage to make a big difference in uh, charging during during sort of uh, around the town. They're mostly for longer term charging where you're already parking for a long time. For the uh, faster charging, there's a DC fast charging, uh, which you, rather than, uh, I won't get into the difference between DC and AC current, but basically it's the current that goes directly into the battery without having to have any conversion. These can get very, very powerful. They require 480 volt uh, sort of industrial strength uh, uh, electricity, which is not available everywhere. Uh, essentially, it requires as much as electricity as a commercial building does. Um, and But it, it's very fast. It adds 60 to 80 miles of range in 20 minutes. So if you're driving, <clears throat> say, from, um, from Trenton to Boston and you need to stop partway along the way for dinner, uh, you can plug in at, at one of these, and by the time you're done with dinner, you might have another 120, 130 miles uh, of range added to your vehicle to go on your way. It's so largely used for inner city uh, and also inter intercity trips and also for um, 
uh, emergency charging, the charging will generally cost a lot more than at any of the other places because they're very expensive and have a big capital investment. Uh, they also um, are used for heavy duty and medium duty vehicle fleets like uh, electric uh, trucks. Um, now, one thing that's sort of interesting uh, and one of the challenges of electric vehicles that a gasoline pump adds about 250 miles of range uh, per minute. So that's sort of the why you generally want to charge your electric vehicle while you're doing something else already. You're not going to want to stand around a charger for even half an hour unless you're doing something else uh, in all likelihood. Um, so typically, most people, this uh, pyramid sort of shows from the bottom of the width, generally shows how what sort of charging is done at which locations and the type of charging that's used. Uh, most people charge at home when they're parked overnight, be that a single family or multifamily home with a level one or level two charging. Employees charging at work may uh, charge also uh, using level one or level two charging. And your fleets, uh, you know, such as municipal fleets will generally use level one or level two, or perhaps a low charge uh, level DC charge, which I didn't talk about before. Public charging metropolitan areas uh, is, is, you know, there's a lot of these out there. They're becoming less necessary as vehicle batteries get larger. Um, and then the intermetro charging, you will typically as a vehicle owner, you'll use that only occasionally for long trips uh, when you're going between uh, metropolitan areas where you're range of vehicle may not may not take you. Um, however, um, you know, the EV world's changing really fast. Uh, this, you know, just yesterday, the um, Ford announced the F-150 Lightning, which is the first mainstream uh, for Ford F-150 is the, fast, is the highest selling vehicle in the US and there's now an electric version of it uh, and its success or failure will really be very important in determining the uptake of electric vehicles. Uh, currently, most vehicles out there are sedans. Most electric vehicles are sedans, which make up only a quarter of the sale of passenger vehicles in the US. Uh, so pickup trucks and SUVs coming on board uh, with uh, electric vehicles is re very important for this. Also, there's some commercial vans that can replace some of the, uh, you know, Amazon has ordered, I think, 100,000 um, such vans. And uh, so that can make a big, a big difference in um, in, uh, in in bringing electric vehicles, uh, battery density, which is a big issue. Um, you know, how 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 much energy can a battery hold, uh, uh, <clears throat> both in size and in weight, uh, is very important. Obviously, the bigger the battery, the longer the vehicle can go, or the larger the vehicle can be. The prices uh, of these batteries are decreasing significantly, which again will will both mean longer ranges for vehicles and lower prices. Most vehicles sold today have a range of at least a couple hundred miles, many 300. I saw a vehicle the other day that had a range of 500 miles as being released, which can get you pretty far uh, as long as you have a place to charge at your destination. Um, under the current um, a Biden administration, there's a, uh, if they have their, uh, if they get their legislation they'd like through Congress, they're hoping to have significant more amounts of uh, public funding coming. Uh, exactly what that will be is to be determined. But it's quite likely that the total cost of ownership for electric vehicles, uh, you know, including not only the initial capital cost, which is typically higher for an electric vehicle than the equivalent internal combustion engine, uh, plus the operation maintenance, which is significantly lower for an electric vehicle. Um, you know, you're paying gas equivalent of about it, less than a dollar a gallon gasoline equivalent as far as the mileage goes. Uh, and then the, uh, there's a lot less maintenance for electric vehicles because they have many, many, many fewer parts and they don't have uh, hot gases flowing through those parts. So there's, there's just a lot less, um, lot less maintenance, no, no oil change, uh, very little brake wear because they use brakes to regenerate electricity. Also used vehicles are starting to appear on the market, which can significantly change who can afford these vehicles. There's also starting to be a lot of opportunities in the goods movement world for, uh, for regional delivery uh, trucks, which can make a big difference in air quality, particularly in uh, those neighborhoods that tend to have uh, depots or a lot of curbside delivery. Um, so that's, a, that's a very good for air quality. Also, if it's in print, it may be out of date already uh, because uh, vehicles are, uh, this stuff is changing so quickly. Um, I see that uh, Tracy has come on. Should I skip the rest of my slides? Talking about the what what municipalities need to do to evaluate their fleets and so forth. Well, uh, do you? We, we can give you another minute or two, um, and then we'll go to the next speaker. If you uh, want to do some highlights. 
Okay, I thought you told me I had 20 minutes, but uh, I guess not. Um, all right, uh, so then when you incorporate vehicles in your fleet, we have, uh, you want it to be a success, it's really gonna be just a pilot. Um, you want to find a vehicle that's used regularly, probably one that can uh, have a vehicle wrap on it. Uh, so you can publicize that it's a electric vehicle. Uh, you want it parked in the same location overnight. Uh, this is you know, for municipalities um, and be parked in a building where you can easily get a uh, charger. Uh, you can evaluate your fleet and DVRPC can help you with this. Uh, if you have your vehicle identification numbers, we can help you um, just evaluate what, what vehicles in your fleets and what the best vehicles to replace them are. And that's all. Thank you, Rob. Uh, next, now we're going to transition over to Andrea Friedman from uh, the Department of Environmental Protection, and I'm going to share her slides one second. There we go. Andrea. Thank you, Tracy. Hi, everybody. I'm Andrea Friedman. I work in the Division of Air Quality Bureau of Mobile Sources at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And we are the lead on electric vehicles for DEP. I know I've seen many of you before at these presentations. So I hope to see you in person again next year. So I'm gonna turn off my video while I talk to you and then I'll come back on for the Q&A. Uh, next slide, please. So today I'm going to talk about two things. I'll quickly go over some of the incentives for EV and charging infrastructure that are available from several state agencies. And um, I will spend more time on thinking about zoning and permitting for local governments for EV charging projects for applications that come before the local governments. Next slide, please. All of the resources I talk about today are listed on our flyer, EV resources for local government. This is a real handy printed out one page double sided. It lists the incentives and gives links to all of them. It also has information on procurement tools, including all of the vehicles that are on New Jersey state purchasing contracts that makes it easy for local governments to uh, to buy vehicles. It includes policy and planning resources from the state and from the metropolitan planning organizations. It lists all of the sustainable Jersey actions that are relevant to electric vehicles. And it includes some resources for your residents, including New Jersey's rebate program um, to bring down the cost of EVs. Next slide, please. So first I'll talk about it pays to plug in. We've been around for uh, five or six years. This is a grant program that will give up to $4,000 per port for level two chargers at public places, multifamily homes and workplaces. And workplaces can include charging for employees who have their own EVs and drive to work and park there. And it can also include charging stations for fleet vehicles. Um, nearly everybody is eligible, only residential, single family residential homes and multifamily less than five units are not eligible. So this is a first come first served program. We're accepting applications now and you can apply online. Next slide, please. It pays to plug in also has a newer component. These are large grants for public fast chargers at uh, high traffic locations. This program is different from the level two program. The level two program, level one and level two is first come first served. The fast charger program is competitive solicitation only. We expect to have another funding round within the next few months. Um, we had one a few months ago, we uh, uh, awarded uh, several tens of millions of dollars, and we will have tens of millions of dollars uh, available in the future as well. So we are doing um, strategic mapping now um, to evaluate good locations throughout the state for public fast chargers. So this is for competitive solicitation. At the end of my slides, I will show you an address, a web address for you to get on our listserv. That's the best way to be notified of the solicitations for this one and a few others that I'll be talking about. Next slide, please. 
We have a grant program for electric shared mobility programs. It is vital that everybody have access to clean electric transportation, not just people who can afford to buy their own cars. So we are also funding electric shared mobility programs like electric car sharing and electric ride hailing services and shuttle services. We are prioritizing programs that benefit overburdened communities. Uh, this is competitive solicitation and stay tuned for future funding rounds. Next slide, please. We offer grants for medium and heavy duty vehicles. These are for electric uh, large trucks and equipment that will replace old diesel vehicles and equipment. Some of the examples are school buses, transit buses, garbage trucks, delivery trucks, that sort of thing. Um, it includes funding for the associated charging equipment. Uh, this is what we used to call the Volkswagen grant. Um, we have worked through that money. So in the future, it'll be funded by funding from proceeds from REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And again, for this program, overburdened communities, environmental justice communities will prior be prioritized. This is a competitive solicitation. We expect funding round uh, shortly. Next slide, please. NJ Zip is a new program that started up in April. It's from the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, NJEDA. It is for uh, medium and medium duty vehicles in the greater Camden and greater Newark areas. Now that is, covers more than 70 municipalities centered around Camden and Newark. So if you are anywhere near Camden and Newark, you might want to take a look at this. Next slide, please. Uh, and my colleague Kathleen Lewis from the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities will tell you about BPU's rebate program for EV purchases, as well as utility incentives that will be rolling out later this week. Uh, the rebate program is closed, will be will we reopen in the new fiscal year, and Kathleen will talk about that. Next slide, please. So I want to, want to move on from incentives and talk about zoning and permitting for EV charging infrastructure. We know that this is relatively new for most New Jersey municipalities and uh, the legislature and state agencies are going to provide some resources to help municipalities work through this process. Um, with millions of dollars of incentives available and with a wide range of EVs on the market now and coming soon, municipalities should expect to see applications for permits for EV charging infrastructure, especially fast chargers. Um, next slide, please. So this is, this is the news. There is legislation in the New Jersey Assembly that is expected to receive a vote this afternoon. Assembly Bill 2108, um, it passed out of committee last week. We'll receive a vote today. Um, I'll talk about the key provisions. There's some more in there, but these are the biggies. The bill would establish zoning and permitting standards for the installation of charging stations and charger ready parking spaces. I'll talk a little about what that means later. In new construction, it would require a certain number of charging stations and charger ready stations, I'm sorry, charger ready parking places in new construction. That is for new construction with parking lots and garages and uh, new multifamily homes with five or more units. And it, the bill would require the Department of Community Affairs to publish a model ordinance within 30 days that will be provided to the local governments for adoption. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go through each of these major provisions, but first a little terminology. The term EVSE means electric vehicle supply equipment. That means charging stations. That's the actual equipment, uh, the, the, the charging station itself, the box, the cables, the plugs. Make ready. A make ready parking place is the same as a charger ready parking place. That's everything except the actual charger. It means the pre wiring of electrical infrastructure in a building and uh, at, through the parking lot to the parking space to make future installation 
of the charging station fast and less expensive. So that includes things like the service panels, the conduit that runs under the ground, the wiring. Um, if it, the, the building needs new electrical service from the utility, it includes that. So that is known as make ready or charger ready. So the zoning and permitting permissions, an application that comes to a local government for charging stations or charger ready parking shall be considered a permitted accessory use and a permitted accessory structure in all zoning and use districts. And it shall not require a variance. The application shall not be subject to review based on parking requirements. At existing buildings, an application for charging stations or make ready shall not be subject to site plan approval, shall not require a variance, and shall be approved through issuance of the zoning permit. This will make these applications much more straightforward for the local governments. And uh, a parking space with char a charger or make ready shall count as at least two parking spaces. This is a nice incentive for uh, charging stations because it helps meet the parking minimums. Next slide, please. For new construct certain new construction, it sets a required number of charging stations and charger ready parking places. And this is a bit in the weeds, but basically for new multifamily buildings with more than five units, 15% of the parking spaces shall be make ready. And immediately a third of those shall have chargers installed. And then over time, over six years, all of the rest of the chargers should need to be installed. So uh, over six years, 15% of those parking places will have charging stations. Um, overall, at least 5% of the chargers must be accessible to people with disabilities. Um, local governments can require that they be installed faster, but they cannot require that, that a higher number. So this bill sets the maximum required. Um, an application requiring a new garage or parking lot, the number of make ready spaces is based on the number of parking spaces in that garage or parking lot. Next slide, please. Um, and one note on the previous slide is that there are two exemptions. Single family homes are exempt and retailers with 25 or fewer off street parking spaces are exempt. So a little about the model ordinance. DCA will publish, publish the model ordinance in 30 days. It will include the provisions of the bill. The model ordinance will address sightline installation and setback requirements and other health and safety related specifications for the chargers and the make ready parking spaces. It will be effective in each municipality. The municipalities can encourage additional make ready or chargers, but cannot require them. And that's one of the provisions of this bill. The municipalities in their ordinances can adopt additional reasonable standards to address installation, sightline, and setback requirements or other health and safety specifications. So the, the, um, the legislation does give some flexibility to the local governments to adapt things to their local conditions. Next slide, please. The DEP is working collaboratively with other state agencies and stakeholders, including Sustainable Jersey and the Metropolitan Planning Organizations on several tools to support municipalities. So in addition to DCA publishing the model ordinance, the state will issue a best practices guide, a sample permitting checklist and some educational materials about EV charging infrastructure to give support to the local governments. We understand that this is um, new material for the most part. The best practices guide will include other provisions you might want to consider over and above the minimums that are set by the legislation. 
So including things you can think about like signage, floor paint, lighting, setting fees, future proofing, etc. Next slide, please. So for more information about EVs, charging, incentives, policy support, you can check out Drive Green New Jersey, that's DEP's electric vehicle website. Next slide, please. That's also where you can find the, uh, the flyer that I mentioned at the very beginning. Um, please follow us on social media. We're very active and we post updates nearly daily. And the way to find out about the funding solicitations and program updates is to join our listserv. That's at the, the link at the bottom of the page. It's also listed on our website. Um, we will not flood your inbox. We only send things out maybe once a month when we have something really important to announce. Um, and especially whenever we have uh, a call for funding, we put that on, on our listserv. Feel free to, next slide, please. Feel free to reach out to me at DEP. I'd be happy to talk to you. If you are thinking about applying a grant and would like to chat before doing the work to put in an put in an application, um, we'd be more than happy to talk to you. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Andrea. Uh, now we're going to transition over to Kathleen Lewis at the uh, Board of Public Utilities. Kathleen, you can go ahead and uh, share the screen. There we go. Let me just make it a full screen and then we can get started which is of course the thing that I remembered how to do and now can't remember because it's a <laughs> new system. Oh, I know what it is. It's under view. It is. I just can't see view. It's, the, just... it's in the menu on the second one over. Uh, up there. there? No, the next uh, couple there over, it is. there view. Uh -huh. Thank you. Certainly. There we go. Part of it is it was hidden by Zoom. Um, so happy to be here, um, and I think there's some some new and exciting stuff that we're going to talk about in just a, a few minutes as we um, start. So um, first and foremost, hold on, I'm going to go. Um, so we are very excited. Our Charge Up New Jersey um, program in year one, um, which is the program that Andrea had um, started to mention to you. Um, had a very successful first year. Uh, we launched the program in May of 2020 and vehicles that were sold between January 17th and December 15th of 2020 were eligible for up to $5,000. Um, we saw most of those receive that $5,000 um, and we have funded over 7,600 um, new electric vehicles on the roads and that is almost $37 million in incentives. So we were very excited by that. Um, and that has um, led us to year two of our program. Um, so if you, if you are following um, our programs, you may have noticed that we dropped a straw proposal um, on Tuesday. Uh, and that is our refresh of the program when we get to fiscal year 22. The legislature um, created the Charge Up New Jersey program for 10 years. This is the second year. The first year we were able, we um, were prescribed by the legislature about how we were authorized to hand out those incentives. Um, and in year two, we are making adjustments to the program. And when we looked at the program, um, we had a couple of things that, that we really wanted to focus on. Um, first and foremost, we are making it a point of sale program. As a point of sale program, that means that the incentive amount will get taken off the top of the MSRP. Um, so you will be financing or leasing it based on that price after the incentive versus the post-purchase incentive that we had in year one, which meant that you had to wait for that money to come back to you. Um, point of sale helps to make this a much more accessible program for lots of our residents um, who just quite honestly can't afford to wait for a couple thousand dollars to come in the mail. Um, they don't have that up front. So we're very excited about that piece. And then we are also focusing on making sure that we are getting to incentive essential folks. Um, incentive essential means that the 
incentive is closing the affordability gap for those who would not purchase an EV otherwise. Um, and so we are looking to utilize that $30 million that the legislature has given us and making sure that we can get it to as many of those incentive essential folks as possible. Um, so right up front, um, here are the differences between year one and year two. Um, as I mentioned, a straw proposal went out on Tuesday. Um, so these are all proposed changes. There will be a stakeholder meeting on May 27th at 10 a.m. You'll probably see a slide very similar to this at that stakeholder meeting. Um, and then comments are due on June 2nd of 2021. Um, and then this will be hopefully included in our FY22 budget so that we can begin the new fiscal year and start the point of sale program. Um, everything on the left in blue is year one. Um, it was a very simple program. It must, your vehicle must have been purchased or leased in the state of New Jersey. It must also be registered in New Jersey to a New Jersey licensed driver. The MSRP must be less than $55,000 and you got $25 per e-mile up to $5,000. Um, we are keeping much of this the same in year two, you can see that. Um, one of the largest differences is that we are recommending a soft cap um, for MSRPs of over $45,000, the maximum incentive would be $2,000. And again, that is to focus on those incentive essential folks and to help stretch our dollars um, a little bit further um, to make sure that we are getting more EVs on the road. Um, in addition to this, one of the other recommendations that we are looking at and questions that we are asking is whether or not there should be a flat incentive for PHEVs um, because utilizing that $25 per e-mile, that incentive was under $1,000 um, and that may not be enough to incentivize folks to move to a PHEV, which, which may be that bridge vehicle for them. Um, so we are looking for feedback on all of those pieces, and we are excited to be able to start talking about year two now. Um, beyond the, the vehicle incentives that we have been working on, we have been working very closely um, with our utilities to make sure that we are building out the infrastructure that we need for charging. We all know that one of the big hurdles to moving towards EV adoption is range anxiety. That idea that I don't have some place to charge this vehicle, I'm not gonna be able to make those long trips. And so we have been working on um, creating those standards. Back in September of 2020, we created those standards, for what we refer to as minimum filing requirements for light duty public charging. Um, that allows the utilities to fund um, the make ready pieces of building the charger. So everything up to the, up to the stub. Um, and then you are able to utilize other incentives. Um, the pay, it pays to plug that Andrea talked about, for instance, to pay for the actual charger. Um, in their filings, we, there are four electric utilities in the state. Two of them had already filed and two of them have been approved that are PSE&G and ACE. Um, and then we are still reviewing Rockland Electrics as well as JCP and M. Um, the public charging that will be that is included, the funding for that make ready for public charging for fast charging um, between the two already approved filings, that's up to 1,300 um, charging locations um, or really char chargers themselves. And then on the level twos, that is five over 5,000 level two opportunities for incentives. Um, over the next five years. So we're very excited about that. Um, and what does that really cover? So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, public fast charging, that, that's the first piece. And this was where we really wanted to make sure um, that we, we had a robust public charging opportunity. So that pays for the make ready, as well as creating programs and, and rate setting that will allow for that fast charging um, to to start to be a productive business model. Um, one of the really big obstacles for the fast chargers right now is that it is a very it is a very new market. Um, and there is a cost associated with being able to charge at any moment. Um, we refer to those as demand charges um, because they need to have that electricity ready and supplied. Um, the minimum filing requirements require there to be a solution um, in the early days of this market, because those costs 
become significantly reduced as we have more EVs out there. So if we are building a charging, um, a robust charging network, as well as encouraging the purchasing of EVs, then those, then we will get to price parity um, at some point in the next few years, um, and we will not have those issues. But in the early days of the market, the utilities are going to help offset those charges. Um, residential charging. The utilities can also pay for make ready on the residential side. And really a huge piece of why we allow for that residential charging is because we're going to need to collect data um, and work towards changing driver behavior when it comes to charging. And so allowing for them to utilize utility dollars to pay for that make ready will allow us to collect data on usage, time of charging, how often you charge, so that we can adjust rates and, and make this as economical as possible. And then the last piece, which is a which is really robust and will we'll touch a lot of different places, is the public L2 charging. Um, so not fast charging, but these are the places where you are going to be able to pull into your workplace and charge um, for a couple of hours so that you can get that charge you need to get home. Um, and those are in community locations, so um, town halls, um, parking decks, all of those places workplaces and multi-unit dwellings. And those last two are gonna be really important on our quest for EV equity. Um, for anyone who lives in a multi-unit dwelling, charging becomes much more difficult because you obviously can't just plug in at your garage. Um, so making sure that it is accessible at multi-unit dwellings um, is gonna be very important. Andrea just talked about the planning implications there. Um, these make ready funds are gonna to help to make sure that in the early days, um, those costs can be recouped somewhere. And then workplace is the other place where you're really going to need it. If you live in a multi-unit dwelling, um, you may just decide to charge at work. And so those two are going to help us get to some of that EV equity that we, that we need. Um, I think for everybody here, this is going to be really important. We do have a clean fleet program. Um, it is funded by USDOE dollars. Um, it allows for up to $4,000 per electric vehicle. You can get two of them um, covered by this grant and $1,500 for one level two EV charging station. Um, I will note that in the, um, in the FY22 proposal, in that straw that dropped on Tuesday, we are suggesting expanding this program um, for another year, but this version of the program will close in June. And we do still have money left, and it's one of those programs that if I have money left, I have to give it back to, to the federal government. And I really do not want to give it back. Um, so I would urge anybody who has purchased a vehicle, if you purchased a, a, an electric vehicle, a plug-in electric vehicle um, between December 2019 and June of 2021, um, please make sure that you have applied to this program. Um, you need to have purchase the vehicle already in order to be able to, to receive it. So I know that it's probably late in the game if you haven't purchased it. But if you already have that vehicle in your fleet and you have not applied for this, I would urge you to do so. Um, here is my contact information. Um, we're always happy to talk. Um, we've got lots of really great things going on at the BPU and I could always share more, but I think this is a good place to stop because um, I'm certain there's lots of questions. Oh, you're on mute, Tracy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for that, Kathleen. That was really great. Um, before we go to the questions, I'm going to uh, share my screen and give a quick overview of, um, you know, now that we've heard about all these great options and opportunities from DVRPC, the um, Department of Environmental Protection and the Board of Public Utility, talk about how you get points at, in the Sustainable Jersey Certification Program for undertaking these activities. And uh, Sustainable Jersey has um, actions that support uh, bringing electric vehicles and other alternative fuel vehicles into the municipal fleets. Uh, those actions include the fleet inventory, which helps municipalities evaluate the vehicles are, uh, that are already on their fleets and um, get ready to start thinking about which vehicles would be good to replace with electric vehicles. 
Uh, we also have the Purchase Alternative Fuel Vehicles Action, which awards points for replacing fleet vehicles with um, electric vehicle and other alternative fuel vehicle technologies. And in the schools program, we have the Sustainable Fleets Action, which awards points for electric school buses and other school fleet vehicles uh, transferring over to electric or other alternative fuel vehicle technologies. In um, the other side of our transportation actions pertain to supporting EV adoption in the community. And for those actions, we have the public EV charging infrastructure action. That's where you get points for um, putting in public EV charging or supporting EV charging that's located on private, um, with, through private partnerships with community partners. We also have the Make Your Town EV Friendly action. And this is an action that uh, requires updating your zoning ordinance uh, to talk about uh, electric vehicles and creating a uh, parking ordinance that um, will address electric vehicles as well. And of course, with all of the uh, changes that Andrea was talking about, we'll uh, need to be um, updating as new rules come online, those uh, components of the action. It also gives res uh, resources for first responder training. Electric vehicles are considered very safe, but the uh, first responder response for them is a little different. So it's good to have your municipal uh, first responders know what the um, protocol is. Uh, it also has a requirement for EV outreach, which includes um, EV charging events. And you can see we have a, rub a ribbon cutting here from Secaucus in the picture, and also supporting local employers in workplace charging and multifamily dwellings in getting EV charging as well. And in addition to those actions, Sustainable Jersey has uh, resources to help uh, municipalities get ready for the transition to EVs. And that includes our um, guidance for creating a uh, EV friendly ordinance. Again, um, as the new rules and laws come into play, we will be updating that. And the Sustainable Jersey Alternative Fuel Vehicle Procurement Guide, which again includes links to all the vehicles that are available on state contract and guidance about all the various procurement measure methods that municipalities can use to um, purchase electric vehicles and other alternative fuel uh, vehicles. Uh, now we're just gonna quickly go over some of the um, tips for minimizing EV charging as um, you're looking at putting it in to the municipal um, in for municipalities. The first thing that you want to think of when you're looking at adding EV charging is your unit selection. So as Rob was saying earlier in the presentation, there's different types of charging and um, you know level one and level two and those charging those different types of charging have different costs associated with them level one is much less expensive per uh, parking space than level two so you want to look at the use of the um, the, the proposed uh, length of parking time and uh, the likely use of the folks that are going to be parking in those spaces and choose the least expensive option that will be suitable for that um, parking space. Also within the level two chargers, there are options for networked and non-network chargers. And the difference between those types of uh, chargers are network chargers collect data, user data, for the municipality or the um, owner of the electric vehicle charging. Uh, equipment and uh, they also take credit card payments and non-network chargers simply provide the electricity to the vehicle. Uh, the cost difference between the networked, uh, the non-networked are significantly less expensive to install from the networked level two chargers. So that is one thing that you wanna consider um, when you're planning your EV charging is how much time, it, uh, how long it would take the, um, credit card, the money that you would collect from the network charging to uh, compensate for the price difference between the non-network charger and the networked charger. Uh, some other unit selection um, things to consider is that wall-mounted electric vehicle charging stations cost significantly less than pedestal-mounted. Um, also dual port, which means that one unit can charge uh, two cars at the same time, costs significantly less per port. And also, um, Another thing to keep in mind is that you want to make sure that the unit, the EV charging unit that you select is 
at the same level of electricity as the uh, supply that's available from your um, electrical panel. It won't uh, be cost effective to have an EV charger that's able to give out more amperage than the electric box has available for you. So that's another consideration. Another uh, thing to think of when we're talking about EV charging costs is um, location. So you want to figure out which meter you're going to put the EV charging on before you decide which parking spaces you're going to be um, assigning as the EV charging spaces. Uh, and then you wanna locate those parking spaces as close to that meter and panel as possible. And that will save a lot of money on installation charges. You also really wanna minimize the trenching distance because that's really expensive. You can see here's a picture from Denville's installation where they have the EV charging uh, equipment very close to the meter and the panel, and that would uh, reduce the cost of uh, installation quite a bit. Uh, lastly, you want to always think about the long term when installing EV charging. If you're having electrical work done on any building, always consider that as an opportunity to consider adding electrical infrastructure for EV charging. Also, all new facilities should include thought about EV charging, and you want to um, as Kathleen was talking about with the new incentives available through the utilities, reach out really early in your EV planning process to talk about uh, incentives uh, that may be available for um, the installation of new meters or other equipment. And also they can help you uh, select which meter would be the best choice for your EV charging equipment and help you manage demand charges and um, overall planning. And I wanted to go ahead and put up the uh, contact information for all of our panelists today, in case you wanted to reach out with them, with reach out to them for additional questions. And um, now we want to open a question and answer session. I'm going to let the um, email addresses hang out for just a little bit longer, and then turn off my uh, screen share so that we can have more of a um, presentation, a round robin presentation style. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing now. And you can see all of our panelists. Let's, uh, if you have any questions, please be sure to answer them or enter them into the question and answer. And I'm going to go ahead and look now and see what we have. Uh, let's see. Well, we have a question that is geared towards something uh, Rob talked about. And this is um, I've seen Tesla charging stations at local Wawa. Uh, does it make sense to take up parking at convenience stores? Um, wouldn't malls, restaurants in downtown and other locations where people typically spend more time make more sense? Oh, Rob, you're on mute. I think my speakers, are you able to hear? Okay, I think my, I, my, my main computer uh, failed to turn on this morning, so I'm using alternative technology, which has failed a little bit here and there. Um, this is a good question. It's actually timely. Uh, several of us have been on some calls related to exactly the zoning and placement for DC fast charging, which is the kind of charging that the Tesla's chargers are. Uh, Tesla chargers are sort of unique in that they're privately owned and only Teslas can plug into them. So they probably have their own arrangements with Wawa on placing those. Um, and I think this, there is a challenge uh, on limiting parking to a particular brand of vehicle. Uh, and, and, and I think that we would not, I would not think a municipality should, should do that with their own resources. Uh, it's sort of up to a particular private business as to where, where they want to put the Tesla stations. Now, for more broadly for DC fast charging, uh, you know, there's a good, the, the, the business case that uh, we've talked with Electrify America, which is putting up a lot of DC fast charging stations around uh, the, the country. And their criteria is they like to be at a place, as you note, Jack, where people spend more time. They will not put them in a place that doesn't have something for people to do. They won't really put them in a place that's not open 24-7, uh, at least for, you know, if you're, even in the middle of the night, you may not need an amenity, but you may need the electricity. So they want to make sure that there's a place that has open, you know, reasonably long hours, like a restaurant or a coffee shop, at least. Um, <clears throat> 
so yes, I agree. You don't want to f take up a lot of spaces with uh, with with charging stations. Although it's interesting, there's a town in Pennsylvania uh, that I worked with. It's one of the case studies in the resource kit that I put the link in the uh, chat for. Uh, Phoenixville, which has a very um, important downtown business district, and their downtown business district. Uh, was concerned about reserving parking spaces for electric vehicles. And so what they did was they, uh, I think these were actually Tesla uh, charging stations. Um, they were level two Tesla charging stations. Uh, and what they allowed, they were open to all vehicles, in, including Teslas. Um, but they put them at reg in a regular parking lot at a regular meter, but they just made that meter more expensive uh, than the other meters. And any car was legally able to park there, but they tend to be kept free uh, for for electric vehicles. But it satisfied the business district by not taking up a valuable parking spaces. Uh, but yeah, the siting of DC fast charging stations they need to be near exits for long trips generally, uh, or, or as you note, they need to be near and they need to be near some sort of amenity. I don't know if anyone else has other things to add. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, there's a couple of pieces there and I'll add on to what Rob said. So if you are looking to utilize public funds, um, including the utility programs, they cannot be proprietary plugs. And if you are um, using a proprietary plug, they can be co-located um, for a, a reduced um, incentive from a utility perspective in some utilities, but um, they have they have to be accessible to all. Um, I will also say that, that yes, the model has been um, to co-locate, you know, to locate them in places where you ha can spend a lot more time um, because it does take longer to charge them. Um, but I think that you will continue to see convenience stores and gas stations um, looking to put them in because they see this as the new piece to their to their our, their business model. And most gas stations have moved to those bigger convenience stores anyway. Um, so that is going to continue to be a piece of this, especially on the fast charging side, um, because malls and restaurants aren't open 24 hours a day. And if you need to fast charge, um, that's going to take you half an hour, but you need some place to go in the meantime. Great. Uh, I agree. Well, <laughs> Another question that uh, was in the um, Q and A is: Has the state considered installing charging ports at state parks? I can, can answer we... that. Yes, DEP is looking into that right now. Absolutely. Great. Did anyone you have anything to add about that? No, I think we're good. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, seeing um, here's another question: uh, Seeing school buses reminded me: Is the state or DVRPC looking at uh, vehicle to grid technology? Uh, school buses or other fleets with periodic use are ideal. Uh, Rob, that goes to you. Well, I'll, I'll start on this. I'm sure uh, Kathleen, I imagine, has more to say about this from the regulatory standpoint. Um, I know that you know school buses, in theory, at least have uh, you know they're used. Their usage is uh, in the morning and at in the afternoon, and otherwise they sit uh, doing nothing uh, except for field trips and so forth. But generally, the large portion of the fleet is not doing much, and uh, at night, uh, sorry, and it, it, they charge very nicely at night when the rates are low. Uh, and they're usually parked in a same in the same place. And in the summer, when electricity demand is highest in the afternoon, uh, they are um, not generally not being used. There are some being used year round, but most most uh, school buses sit idle. And so, in theory, you could have say a solar uh, array on top of a school that charges the school buses, that then provides electricity back to uh, the school or back to the grid. Uh, and, uh, you know, it could work. I have not, um, I, I wouldn't say looking at it, but we're thinking about it and realizing that it's a potential opportunity. Uh, I'd say right now, uh, in fact, there's a project that um, both, uh, I, I, I know that the Clean Cities program in Pennsylvania and maybe the Clean Cities program in New Jersey is involved with is trying to work on school bus. They have some loaner school buses in theory at least there's a couple of problems right now the one is the school bus uh production is quite uh, constrained right now uh of electric school buses is my understanding and also right now uh with covid this has been a very bad time to outreach to schools on electric school bus issues where we did some outreach to schools a while back on 
uh, natural gas school buses when that was the flavor of the month. Um, <clears throat> and we found that the best time to do it is in the spring uh, due to the way that the school bus managers work on things. So we're hoping to start our outreach next spring on, on school buses. And certainly looking into the V to G uh, would be great. Um, it's, it's, so I don't know if Ka uh, Kathleen has more sure. to, to so, offer. So V to G is something that we're looking at. I think that, you know, this is, um, there, there's a lot of pieces to this. Um, and we have focused on in the last year or so, the light duty piece, because that is the, the market that is most, that is farthest along. Um, the next segment that we are looking at is medium and heavy duty. Um, and there are some specific use cases where V to G may be far enough along that that it may be something that we look at, but but again, that is is in the future. Um, the board intends to do another straw proposal process, much like we did for light duty in creating um, minimum filing requirements. Um, and we'll be doing that later this year. Um, and V to G is probably going to be a discussion whether we include it in the straw or whether people ask about it. I'm certain that it will be part of that discussion. Great, thanks. We have another question coming in saying, uh, will the new model ordinance uh, be nested into the land use code? So there are pieces of, of it that will be included in um, the, the law that is created will create some of those pieces. The model ordinance will be on top of that. Um, and they will, and the code is, the code will continue to evolve. So this is not a static process um, because we know that right now the code doesn't touch it at all. Um, so that will be a static process and it will, it will move along with the code in that regular process. Great. Uh, let's see, we've got most uh, level two chargers are set up to bill per minute or hour. How can station owners change billing per kilowatt hour, particularly those charge point network units? So the EV law um, allowed for the, it, well, actually I'll say this, the EV law made it so that it was clear that selling, you know, charging for charging having a fee for charging was not the resale of electricity. And that was one of the barriers to having that kilowatt, that per kilowatt charge. Um, so you are allowed to do that. That is something that the owner operator has to decide and to set, but there is nothing that prohibits you from doing that. So towns are allowed to say it's an hour, like a, a dollar per hour or just at a flat. Correct. So they're allowed to say it's a dollar per hour. They're allowed to say it's a dollar per kilowatt hour. Like they're they're allowed to set it however they want. The EV law made it very clear that it is not the resale of electricity, which is what would have prevented it. Thank you. That's very clarifying. Um, we also have a question in about hydrogen technology. Um, it said, wouldn't investing in hydrogen refilling stations result in more uh, hydrogen vehicles and a, a drop in pricing competition. Hasn't this occurred in Germany and California? Uh, Rob, I think this is a reaction to what you were talking about. Do you have anything to say about that? I Well, I just know that currently my understanding uh, from looking at the federal government's uh, alternative fuel um, website is that the nearest charging, the nearest hydrogen public, public filling station for hydrogen is in Connecticut. Um, uh, it's a whole challenge. I mean, hydrogen, I think it's great that California is doing their experiments with, with hydrogen. Uh, there's a bunch of, a couple main challenges. One is hydrogen as the smallest molecule is uh, very, very hard to um, uh, hold on to. So uh, when you put hydrogen under pressure, it will leak out of your uh, hydrogen tank. So you have to use a vehicle that's using it all the time. Uh, making hydrogen currently uh, in, in the, at the scale needed to fuel uh, transportation systems, it's generally made from natural gas with a process called um, hydroforming or something where you heat it up with water. Uh, and it, it's a, it's a, it doesn't have a very good life cycle um, uh, uh, carbon uh, footprint. 
using electricity, you may say renewable energy to turn hydrogen to turn water into hydrogen using hydrolysis has been done, but apparently there are some real uh, problems of the fact that it's distributed where all the electricity is. It's just, it's just it doesn't to put it anywhere near the rate that um, it would be useful. And I haven't seen a, a life cycle on sort of the electricity needed to create hydrogen and then using that hydrogen in a vehicle compared to using that electricity to just charge a battery. I haven't seen that analysis, but I imagine there's a fair bit of, um, my guess is that it's more efficient to use the electricity directly in batteries. Now, the great thing about hydrogen is you can fill a vehicle, you know, as fast as you can with gasoline. Uh, I think it's coming down the line and there's a lot of research in it. There's a lot of desire for hydrogen fuel cells to work uh, among users. It's much better than battery electric vehicles as far as the weight and the fueling and the range, uh, but the technology just isn't uh, economical yet. And I, uh, you know, it's, it's it, I, I would hope it would be a better solution, frankly, than charging electric vehicles. And it may be the case that 10, 15, 20 years from now, uh, we will be talking about how to get hydrogen infrastructure everywhere. And I can add a little bit to that. Um, a single hydrogen fueling station costs between $2 million and $4 million. EV fast charging stations cost much less than that. And the other disadvantage to, to um, hydrogen is that you can't feel at home. You can't have a hydrogen fueling station in your garage or at your parking place. So um, a fleet of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles would need to have that network of fueling stations, just like gas stations, because we don't have gas stations in our garage. So that is another advantage to um, battery electric vehicles over fuel cells. But you are correct that having, the, having a network um, all up and down the East Coast of hydrogen fueling stations would attract the manufacturers to sell those vehicles in the state getting there would be extremely expensive. If I could just add one brief thing, I think that this may be a solution for the heaviest duty vehicles mm -hmm. over time where a fleet would have its own uh, ability to fuel. I don't think it's really going to be a solution for passenger vehicles. Uh, I would imagine it will come first in heavy duty vehicles uh, because their downtime uh, vehicles tend to have very little downtime because if you, know, if you have to charge your vehicles overnight for a school bus, for a lot of delivery fleets, for municipal fleets, that's not a problem. But if you're a, uh, a class eight truck that's transporting things across the country, you're using that truck all the time. So, and I think that, uh, you know, two things to add. One, I think that so much of when we talk about EV adoption, so much of this, I look at this, um, from my history in transportation and traffic safety. This is about changing driver behavior. We're all used to, to having to fill up, but also we're very used to that, that moment when you get in your vehicle and you go, oh darn, I have to go fill up and that's gonna take me an extra 15 minutes and now I'm late for work. Um, so there's advantages and there's disadvantages. And one of the behaviors that we're gonna have to change is how we expect to do these things. And, you know, we expect to be able to drive that five hour trip on one tank of gas. Now you may need to, you, you may need to change that and you're gonna break it up with a 45 minute lunch while you charge up for 30 of those minutes. Um, there are changes, there's, there's goods and bads and we need to adjust our behavior. Although I will say this, I think that if there was ever a moment in time where we are going to be able to say, no, it's fine for me to sit at my house and have my vehicle charged. No, I don't need to drive that much. COVID has really provided a wonderful opportunity for us to change those behaviors. Um, and then the other piece of this, when we talk about hydrogen, when Rod talks about you know, that really heavy duty piece, there is going to need to be a national conversation about how we deal with heavy duty networking because whether it's electric or hydrogen, until there is a national network, we're not going to see that move because a heavy duty vehicle is not going to electrify just because there's charging in New Jersey. It has to drive further. And so whether that technology is hydrogen or electric, um, 
that is going to depend on, on which gets to market faster and which is accepted. And quite honestly, it's the newest version of Apple versus Android or beta versus VHS. It doesn't really matter which one's better. It matters which one gets there first and people accept. And, and, and that's where we are. Great, thank you so much for that. We had a couple questions come in about the bill that um, Andrea gave an overview of. Uh, first, uh, one of our guests wanted to um, have you restate the, the number of the bill so that they could look up the text for it. It's A2108, A Assembly 2108. Great, and then also, um, are you, do you know if the bill will allow for the multi-use requirements, will the bill allow for level one charging to meet those requirements? Is that something that's clarified in there? It will not. No, these have to, no, no, these will not be level one. Although I will say um, that is one of those places where municipalities are allowed to encourage but not require things. You could absolutely encourage level one. And I think that there is a large conversation as we move right. towards electric vehicles one of the things we've talked about incentives and we've talked about all of those pieces, the largest incentive to getting an electric vehicle and the largest price pressure is going to be that all of the manufacturers are moving to electric. And so first and foremost, you're going to see a huge drop in price when um, the federal government has committed to electric vehicle conversion. As soon as they have to start building those, those models and getting them out on the road, it's going to lower prices. Second, we already have a lot of manufacturers who are committing to all electric production by 2035, by 2040. And so at that point, there is going to need to be a whole lot more charging options, especially in multi-unit dwellings. Right now, we're focused on those level twos and fast chargers at the multi-unit dwellings to, to get us there. But level one is going to have to be part of that discussion and sort of how they get placed is going to be part of that discussion. There's there's a lot of different views on that. Um, one of the most interesting, I always think, is the idea that you put the fastest charging the furthest away from the building and you put the level ones right up front so that you only use that fast charging if you really need it. Um, and that means you have to walk a little bit further. Um, so those are going to be some of those discussions as this continues to evolve. If I could just add one real quick thought on that, you know, one of the one of the challenges for electric vehicle charging is that the product you're providing, the electricity, is very inexpensive, and often the overhead in collecting money uh, from a from a user can overwhelm the cost of the electricity itself. So, for instance, at a workplace charging, uh, it may be easier from an administrative standpoint to give away level one charging. Mm -hmm. which only will cost a business about 75 cents a day for their customers, uh, about the same as providing free coffee, rather than putting all the overhead for tracking who's using it, uh, making sure it gets deducted from their pay, and all of that, that can cost much more than the, than the actual electricity itself. And this is, I think, a problem that, uh, you know, is, is the cost of, and that's where the, that's where also, frankly, the charging companies, uh, make their money is on that part of it, not on the electricity itself. So it's a, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how this evolves over time. I think too, the other part of this is, is that we talk about these as part of the, the range anxiety solution. And so these are publicly accessible charging, level twos and fast charging, because it's not just for the residents. I mean, that is absolutely a piece of this, but it's for the people who are driving to go visit them. I drive an hour and a half to go visit my grandmother in her in her senior complex, I need to top off before I go home. Um, that's who part of this charging is for as well. And building out that network so that people see this as a valuable option and a right. viable option. And it's unclear as ranges get longer and longer that charging that's you know, will will change. You know, the, the demand for that charging will will change and it's unclear. And also there's lots of market forces out there that want certain things to happen that may, just like the Betamax VHS, I think the agreement at the end was that the Betamax would have been the better technology, but VHS had the market power. And so it's similar here. I think what we want to happen ideally from a policy standpoint may not be what um, the market makes happen, I think. So we'll you know, see. I... 
we're a little we're at time, uh, but there's one more question uh, that I think I'd like to ask on the webinar here, and that uh, goes I think to Kathleen. It says, "Are you aware of any barriers to installing charging stations in senior communities?" Um, so the barriers are the same as anywhere. Um, so I think that first and foremost, the um, municipal ordinances will really help. Um, the other piece, so there's lots of different senior communities, and I can't tell exactly which one you're talking about. Um, but it's also possible that there are HOA rules that you that have similar barriers to what we're seeing with municipal ordinances right now. So the barrier on a municipal level is this idea of, I don't know what it is. It's not a permitted use right now. So you have to go through this very lengthy process to get it. If you live in a senior community that has, um, that have single residences, um, I can I could foresee that an HOA would tell you you're not allowed to put that in because it wasn't already in our in our standards. You would basically have to take um, a similar approach to what we're doing with the municipal ordinances and go to your HOA and say this should be permitted. Um, if you're talking about a multi-unit dwelling, so um, condos, townhouses, um, apartments, you're looking at some of those multi-unit dwelling pieces. And so you're probably going to have to have something that's more of a public charger. Um, again, the um, or the municipal ordinance is going to help with that. Um, but there's nothing specific to seniors um, that that is more of a challenge. But but it's possible that HOAs are, um, are part of that challenge. Thank you so much. Um, well, we're a couple minutes over, but I just wanted to take an opportunity to thank all of our wonderful speakers for joining us today. Um, really great uh, breaking news in a lot of cases and interesting stuff that we got to talk about. Uh, please be sure to go to the um, Sustainable Jersey Summit uh, webpage to see the other um, sessions that are available. And there's uh, a couple more things that are available um, on, as part of the summit today as well. Thank you everyone for coming.